I'm deeply grateful for this opportunity. Um, if y'all don't know what it means to me to be at a church like this, to be able to speak at a church like this, to have a pastor like Jason just recently that would be willing to not only let me, but like he's been walking it with me through this text and helping me and you know we meet up for breakfast and talk and it's been it's been real great for me um so i'm just really thankful really grateful but if you have your bibles um turn to mark chapter 12 i'm gonna tighten this thing up i'm gonna push on that thing careful mark chapter 12 um starting in verse 28 we'll be going through 44 this morning uh, just, in, you know, in the series and in the context of what's going on here, we've obviously, y'all have been going through Mark for a while now. Jose last week took, I believe, what was the first part of this uh, chapter. Now we will finish up the back half. Uh, here here in this, uh, in, the, in the scripture, uh, this is Passion Week. This is uh, Jesus has come to Jerusalem. He's headed to the cross. Uh, this is all leading up to what we celebrate Easter. So, and, and during this time, uh, rather than usual where he would withdraw or not talk or have some conflict with the religious or the people he is literally provoking people he is literally going in and he's challenging on every front what people thought about him who the, what they said about him um, and was just giving some some wonderful examples of of what the gospel is as compared to what they thought it was and what the kingdom is and what they thought it was so in here particularly uh, like I said Jose last week went through the the talents, uh, we, we see some teaching on the resurrection there with the Sadducees. But then this particular teaching we're going to go through this morning, which actually kind of got four parts. Um, Jesus is dealing with the scribes. He's talking about the scribes and what they, they thought about him and then shows an example through a widow of what the kingdom truly is. So Mark 12, uh, are there, verse 28 and through 44. We're just going to read, so bear with me because it's a lot of text. He said, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing he, Jesus, had answered them well, uh, he, he asked, he said, What commandment is most important of all? And Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, uh, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher, for you have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one neighbor as oneself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus said, You are not far, and then Jesus said that he had answered wisely, says, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. And in verse 35, Jesus taught in the temple. He said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, He declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, speaking of Jesus. Then how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And Jesus again in his teaching says, Beware of the scribes who walk around, who in long robes and like greeting places, uh, like greetings in the marketplace, for they have uh, and they have the best seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at feast. Who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers, for they will receive the greater condemnation. And then he sat down opposite the treasury, speaking of Jesus, watching the people putting in money, putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said, Truly I say to you that, not, uh, that those who were contributing to the offering box, that sh this poor widow has put in more than all those who were contributing to the offering box. For they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Let's pray. Father, help us to see you this morning through this text through your teaching, through your correction of the scribes, through the picture of the widow, Lord, all of this, may we see you, may we see the goodness that you are in the, your kingdom, and that we may know your kingdom more through this. Father, help to open our eyes to see this, Lord, uh, your Holy Spirit to move. We are helpless without you uh, in this moment, Father. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. All right, for introduction, I really don't have a story, but mainly a suggestion. Uh, as you, as we, as we go through this text together, 
as we, as we work through seeing what Jesus is saying and what he's talking about with these scribes and the widow and the Pharisees, I'd encourage you to not only listen, but pray. Pray, pray through this. Now, now, some of you may do this anyhow, and it's a wonderful practice, and there's a lot of good from it. And some of you may not, which is fine. But it, you don't have to. But just a thought, because this is heavy stuff, and this is important stuff, and it's, it's beautiful pictures of the gospel. And we need the Holy Spirit to, to actively work in us as we pray or we participating so we're not just sitting to soak in information for the sake of information. Uh, we, we need to be actively working here. It's a supernatural event when you hear God's word preached, not because I'm preaching it, but because it's his word. And so with that, it's not just something to, to download. It is literally an active work. And I, I just pray and encourage you just, just to be praying through. And, uh, and then concerning this text, pray, pray with these few thoughts, thinking, think, thinking through these, through, uh, these three thoughts, actually, that we're going to go through uh, for the next few minutes. Uh, for one thing, the hopelessness of trying to live on more than God. Uh, so when we're praying, think about that. Think about, let God just take inventory on you. May we take inventory on ourselves and, and how we may see the hopelessness of when we try to live on more than God. Secondly, the hope, hopefulness, rather, not hopeless, hopefulness of a life that fully relies on God. Uh, so right the other side. So not the hopelessness of relying on yourself, but the hopefulness of relying on God. And uh, that God may begin to birth and stir in you a deeper desire for that. And then here a question that kind of uh, kind of sums them both together, that Jesus will show us the kingdom here in Mark. He will show us the kingdom in Mark, but will we be satisfied with it? And, and with that, if we are satisfied with it, then we will see the hopefulness in that. We will see the hopelessness of what we'll see the scribes go for and what we go for at times. So keep that in mind. And uh, if you're not familiar with this thought, the kingdom, the kingdom is simply, in various different ways, uh, to, to be forgiven to be bound for heaven. Uh, it is literally God's just revealing himself to us uh, th through his kingdom. And also, in a future sense, it is all that he is going to do in, in the future, his eternal will laid out. So it is literally just the will of God. It is the reign of God. It is all that he is uh, built up in, in with this idea of the kingdom. It is a very, you know, there's various different ways to look at it in pictures. And today we're going to see how relying on God is one of those, one of those little facets of the kingdom. So we, we re, as we read, starting there in verse 28, we're going to see Jesus, he gives a glimpse of the kingdom through commandments. Now you see he's teaching there. The, the, the scribe comes up, he says, teacher, you know, he sees that he's wise, he sees his answer correctly. What do you say the greatest commandments are? And then Jesus says, we read that, that, to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe himself would even affirms it. And he says, yes, I agree. I'm with that. And this is much more. He goes a little bit further. He says, this is much more than all the offerings and the sacrifice. He's saying that, that these two commandments are more than anything the Jews could do in order to try to obtain their salvation for themselves. This is what he says. He says, this is better. This is much more. He may not get it completely. Jesus says that makes you, when he says that, Jesus says, okay, then you are near the kingdom. You're, you're starting to get it when you see that fully relying on God is much more than fully relying on your own sacrifices, your own offering that you bring to God. There is something much more there. And the scribe is already trying to catch a, a thought of that, and I hope we are as well. Now, um, it, just to say it another way, that to fully rely on God with everything that we are, uh, finding nothing else worth more than Him, and to love others as ourself as much more than all you can do for yourself. So you see the, just kind of mash it all together, run it together there and, and think about that. We're going to keep running back to that again and again. So that is showing a glimpse of the kingdom through a commandment to love God. It is showing us there's a beautiful thing there that is God and all that he does for us and, and, and that we should rely on him and that from that we are then propelled to love others. So there's a wonderful thought there. And, and, and we have to be careful here. Uh, we can literally take God's laws and commandments and just make them just laws and commandments, just to obey, just for the sake of obeying, so that, well, you all know that I follow the rules. And that is to take it and flatten it out, and you, we miss it if we go that route. And I, and I think maybe this is where the scribe was coming from. He wasn't there yet. Jesus said he was just near. He wasn't there yet. He still just seen it as a rule. He still maybe didn't see it as more, completely more, as the widow, we'll see later, sees it. 
uh, the kingdom of, more, of God. So, so I caution against forcing ourselves just out of sheer determination and grit to just white knuckle and just say, I want to love my neighbor as myself. I'm going to love God with all I am. With everything that's in me, I'm going to do it. Because with everything that's in us, we'll never do it. We'll never make it. I can't, I can't get right. That's the way it is. I mean, that's just how it's going to happen. Uh, but that's not a bad place to be. Uh, so we see the reality, or the, the reality can be true of any of the commands of God if we try to literally just turn them on their head and, and just go for the rule and not go for the one who gives it. All right. So there's a, and, and from that, we, we will literally make a mockery of the cross of Jesus Christ if we do that. Because Jesus died, not just so that you can look godly, but so that you can be godly. You truly can, by the blood of the cross, we are able to not just make it look like it, but that Jesus paid the price for our, our change. Our, our, that, that's the good news of the gospel. So we see with these two great commandments that these are things that are going to happen in us. These things are going to occur because Jesus went to the cross. And if he did that, then we're good. But we have to cling to that. We still have, there is, there is faith still to, go, to, to cling to, to go with. So, not to turn these thoughts on their head. And I would say from there, looking at that, the idea of, of trying to do better, to make it right, to, to make ourselves a, an image that we follow the rules, um, how far are we from the kingdom? How, are we like the scribe? Do we feel like, well, we're near, but we're not there. We're getting close, but not quite. Um, and, and just to literally take inventory, if we're honest, and if I'm honest, I don't, I don't always seek the kingdom. I don't always see it as more. I, I tend to see it as, as something else. I see something else more sometimes. And my actions prove that. The way I live will literally, so if you're taking, if we're taking inventory of ourselves, literally how do you respond to the life that God has given you may show how you see the kingdom, or the value of the kingdom, rather. How do you see Jesus? How do you see God? Is he enough? Or do we respond in ways that shows that maybe he's not enough? I need something else. I need something more which is very foolish and is very, uh, like I said, uh, we, we begin to see like the, the, the old hymn says, you know, Lord, I, I, I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We literally begin to see that, yeah, I'm, I'm there a lot of days. I wake up, I'm there personally, I'm, I'm speaking for Cole now, I literally wake up some days and, and that's about the only thing I bring to the table is that I'm prone to wander and that I need somebody to grab me and God surely will and he does. So, and, and, and like I said, there is, it, it's tough because we want to people to see that we fully rely on God. I want you all to think that about me. It's a wonderful thing that you would say, look how good Cole is and how well he relies on God. I want that. Man, do I want that. But it's not true. I don't. I really don't want to do that. Sometimes I'm not that at all. I don't live on mission in my neighborhood. I'm, I'm not in community thinking that, you know, this is all for the kingdom. I'm thinking it's for me most of the time. This is for my stuff, for, for what I want, for my image, for my, my mission, for whatever that may be. That's a horrible idea. So I, I began to rely on me and not God. I began to rest in my efforts for myself and, and my abilities, not the abilities and the efforts of, of what we already discussed, the cross of what he has done for us. And like I said, it is strange as it may seem. That is a great place to be, to be wrong and know it. Because th there's nothing worse to be wrong and not know it. But if I literally can admit to the fact I am prone to wander, I am prone to leave the God I love, then there's a door there for the kingdom. There's the door for the gospel of the kingdom to come in and, and to rescue me from my wretchedness. So, so we, we see there initially the, the great commandments. Jesus lays them out. He gives them to the scribes. But he, don't st he doesn't stop there. Uh, they, they, don't, they dare not to ask him any more questions. It says there at the end of that, that section. But now Jesus starts asking the question in verse 35. He challenges the, the teachings of the scribes. He says, how can the scribes say that the Messiah is just the son of David? When, when David himself says in the Holy Spirit, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So God says to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Obviously alluding to not an earthly king, that would just an earthly king that would come and deal with the Romans and their oppression and all the nations of Israel's problems. But no, an eternal king, an eternal savior that is much more and has a bigger thought than just some earthly king. So he shows the scribes to be wrong. He says, 
You got it wrong. You're missing the Messiah. The Messiah did not come to save Israel from the Romans. He came to save Israel from her sins. And when he means Israel, not just that Israel, but the nation, the holy nation that he is making, that, that shows his kingdom. So he shows them to have the wrong Lord. He challenges these scribes. The people were glad to hear that, it seems. It said they were glad to hear that he had challenged them. The great throng rejoiced uh, when the scribes were shown wrong. Uh, and it may not seem much to have the wrong Lord. And that's what the scribes had. They literally had the wrong Jesus. But, but what happens when they have the wrong Jesus is they do the wrong things. And this is what he talks about next. So with this correction, Jesus shows that you know, it's, not, it's not merely an earthly line, although Jesus was. Jesus was from the line of David, but he was not just from the line of David. No, not at all. He, was a, he wasn't a king as they see, not at all. He went to the cross, but yet he was a descendant of King David. So they, they missed that. And, and, and they did not see what Hebrews calls, and is great, is the radiance of the glory of God. The, the one God who, who is eternal, who upholds the universe by the word of his power. They did not see that in Jesus. They, they wanted something different. They, uh, and then after making purifications for sin, this Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. That is not the Jesus, the Lord they wanted. The scribes had a different Lord. Now that's our Lord. That's the one we cling to. That's our King. That's our Jesus. We see that. We grab hold of that. And we don't let go. But the scribes didn't. And they lived, they lived differently for that. And as Jose said last week, this is the cornerstone. This is the plumb line. This is all that we have, all we'll ever have, and all we should ever need. We stake our claims and our purpose and our meanings and every breath that we breathe on the fact that Jesus is set at the right hand of the Father. We would have nothing without that. It changes everything for us. And without His life, our life is but ash and a waste. We, we would waste our time if it not for Jesus so they had a merely earthly king. They literally missed it altogether. And honestly, I miss it altogether sometimes. Um, they stood on sinking sand and not on the, on the, of an earthly king and not on the solid rock of King Jesus. And it is tragic. <laughs> but it is a daily reality that I, that I miss this. I miss this Jesus. I don't, I don't see him always sitting, sitting on a throne. I don't look at the glory that is that is king jesus that holds my life together uh and i, I essentially want to have control i want to be the lord i might not even have the wrong lord like they did like a king no i'm i want to be in charge it's my life it's my day who how dare anybody mess up my life and my day today this stupid traffic or these dumb bosses or whatever or anybody of that nature you see what i mean there there you don't we don't we want to be in charge i want to be in charge of this i don't want to I don't want a Lord. We, we have, I have a Lord, but I don't want to talk about that right now. I want to, you know, that's the way we look at it. We just want to move past, and I'm there. That is me, and, and I, I, have to, I have to beg for God to let me see this, to see that I'm wrong, prone, prone to wander, but that God is good enough to hold me and keep me. So, so just to think of, uh, and check ourselves, do we see Jesus rightly? Is he the Lord at the right hand of the Father, our all-sufficient Savior? Or is he merely a person that we know and we pray, pray, uh, pay tribute to from time to time? Because it can be boiled down to that. That's what the scribes had. They just wanted a king they could pay homage to and know oh, that's great and move on and do their own thing. We know Jesus is much more. Is our hearts inclined to him? Our souls resting in this Jesus? Our minds, our minds focus on him and our strength completely relying on him? Do we see that we feel that way? And we want to, but I don't. And we, we went over this, and I, I hope you're feeling some tension there with that. But oh, that God that would give us a clear vision of Jesus and who he is and what he does for us. The ransom for many. Now, this is the Jesus we have, the rescuer of this wretched soul, of y'all's wretched souls. He, he died so that we could have more, not just our own little world and our own little things. This is a vi May we just get it a vision so deep that we're not going to be satisfied with anything less than Jesus and His kingdom. And then once we're there, things will go well because Jesus has given us a sight. We see Him, we, we know Him, and we feel the weight of who He is, yet that He would love me and that He knows me. And we see the Lamb that takes away our sin and the, and the King who sustains our very existence. We need to know this. We need to cling to this. We see Jesus not as the scribes seeing their Lord, but the right Lord. 
th there's no better picture than this than this the way you build a house. Any any builder or construction worker will tell you that if you have a bad foundation, that the whole out the whole house is in jeopardy. Uh, things are not going to fall. the The whole structure is, is going to be uh, it's it, it's really in dire straits because of the concrete and the ground that it stands on. Much the same with us and Jesus. If we have a the wrong foundation, if we are standing on sinking sand, not the solid rock, then the trajectory, the, the path, the life we will then live from that will be the wrong ambitions. We will track and go do the wrong things because we have the wrong Lord. This was what was true of the scribes. This is what is true of us that we form for ourselves a version of Jesus and seek to worship him because that's the one we like, but not the one the Bible reveals. This is why we must constantly be drawing ourselves back and, and acknowledging the fact that we do not get it right. I do not see him clearly, but that he does show himself clearly if we are willing to just stop and listen. So I mentioned the wrong ambitions. So we're moving through verse, uh, we move up to verse, where are we at? Verse 38. Jesus warns the people gathered there of the scribes and their things and what they do. He literally gives a picture. Okay, they got the wrong Lord. They said he's just the earthly king. He is not. He is the eternal Savior. And because of that, they have the wrong Lord. They live the wrong way. And these are some pictures of how they do that. He says, beware of the scribes. They walk around in long, long robes, I guess, so they can be distinguished and note themselves better than everybody else. They, he notes that they like greetings in the marketplaces as someone you need to know. You need to know these scribes. These scribes want to be high and exalted. Uh, they... They, they want the best seats in the synagogue. They want the best seats in the church because they want to be seen. They want to be known. They want the places of honor at feasts. They, they're all about themselves. You want to see the selfish, inward the look they have going on here. And, uh, and, for, and, and to go further, they, they devour widows' houses for the sake of their own greed and their own power to make it look like they're helping the poor widows, but they're really just trying to take their stuff so they can build their self up. So just some, some, some very strong words and pictures here. And then lastly, uh, just for the sake of image, they make long prayers. That for pretense, they just pray big, long, extravagant prayers so people could say, look how great they are and how wonderful and how wonderful I am. That's, that's the scribe's thoughts here. All because they wanted to see him seem important because they, they, wanted to, that they, they thought the king was coming. They want to be high up. They want to be known as great and honored and so on and so forth. Uh, they, they had a need for an, uh, of an important image. And Jesus warns them... Uh, this, this thought, they, they tried to appear godly, but they are not. Their hearts were dead. They were slaves to their own sin and their own ambitions. Uh, their, their strength was found in their images. Their minds were turned inward to self, not outward and upward towards God and others. So there is a, Jesus is warning, and he is saying that these ambitions, these things they do, they will lead to a greater condemnation. He said, this is not going to go well for these guys because they missed me. They don't see me <clears throat> for who I am. Uh, this greater condemnation, tragically, uh, no other thought, it is an eternity apart from God in hell. I mean, tragically, they will trade their, their own image. They want to be built up with their own image, yet they are trading their eternity over for that. They are giving it. They don't, they don't want Jesus. They don't want God. They want to have their own kingdom. And having your own kingdom will keep you out of the kingdom when you get to the other side. And that is exactly what happens to these scribes, and tra tragically, and I, uh, it, it's saddening. And th this is true with any, with anybody who may seek to, to live this way. There is, and Jesus illustrates this best when he he says that uh, the religious of his day he calls them whitewashed tombs. You know, maybe familiar with that? He literally says they're like clean graves, which is kind of pointless. It's a clean and looks good on the outside, but it holds the dead. I mean, there's no point. There, it, it is it is it is useless. They may look godly, but they don't have it. They, they may appear to be. They're having to build up their own images. They have the wrong Lord. They got the wrong. They want an earthly ruler, not an eternal savior. And they sought after selfish, empty ambitions. And they stepped on others that stood in their way along the way up. The poor widows and anybody else that would try to keep them from looking great and glorious. The scribes were in a bad situation, to say the least. So this is the, this is true. This is the misery of religion to need to control things yet never having control to need to build up your image because you have nothing else. It's a desperate place. It is a horrible place. And even worse, if you do not know you're there. And these scribes and their ambitions were, were there, and, and it is true of any religious heart or de and its desires. Uh, so the, the question then stands, what, where, where does my religion lie? Am I to be so proud to think that I don't feel or act like a scribe sometimes? 
I mean, you may say, oh, wait a minute, Cole, this is, uh, you, you're new here. This is Acts 29. We don't, we're not religious here. We're a bunch of drunks and sinners, right? <laughs> that's, 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 our, that's our rep going here. I mean, that, and maybe so, but we still have religious ambitions. We still, and, and Jace, Pastor Jay says all the time, we still, in the dark corners of our desires and our wants, and we, we still have religion that needs to be crushed by the gospel, and, and it surely can be. Um, and, and, and it may work out with not that we treat people outwardly religious like the scribes did. We may look at people religiously. This is just one example. Do we, this idea that we want to be seen as right, as having it together, this is very true of us, I think, within our particular in our gospel centeredness and our good theology we, we seem to be like we got it figured out in our box as much idiots that's very religious that's very that's very like i'm better i'm here these are these poor churches they don't know what they're doing that that is the most religious thing we could ever do and it, it truly undercuts our good theology and our gospel centeredness we truly trick ourselves we truly miss that now if we had to be honest we have to really think about how that can work and i'm, I'm the same way there's nothing more i like than to be right and to be shown right. And my wife can testify to that. I really, I like that. I like when I'm shown to be, look at him. He did the right thing. That's a smart guy right there. So, I mean, that is, that is dangerous. Dangerous to be there. That is, the, that is the niche of a religious heart and desires. Because then we start to do, I want to do what I want to do. I want to be looked right. I want to be the best seats in the synagogue. I want to be shown to have the best seat at the table. Oh, look at him. He's so great and grand. Look how wonderful he is. Uh, we can, I can feel the pride welling up when I've been shown right and proved right. And, and this is the, the danger of religion. Uh, so honest, if we're honest, we're probably at all at some point not beyond the need to feel right. We want to be shown right. We want to be the, the one who, who, who never gets it wrong. Uh, rather than loving others and neighbors as ourselves, we just worry about our own image and ourselves, and we just want to be shown as good and God having it all together. So there's another element. This maybe go to, to, to the ladies. It, maybe not theology, but just wanting to hold it all together so that you look like you've got it figured out. Well, the, the bill is out. The, the story's out. It, you don't have it all together. The Bible tells me that none of you have it together, and I don't have it together either, so there's no secret. So, so why do we try? Why do we try to hold it together? Now, it's not at all going to happen. You never will. If we, if we think we do, then what do we, we make a mockery of the cross and the very thing that Jesus died to obtain for us. We, we literally undercut Calvary for the sake of our religious image. And how terrible is that? And how tragic, it is tragic enough to land in hell. And you understand that. That is what, that's the trajectory there. Just like the, just like the scribes. They're, they're greater condemnation. Not just earthly uh, mishaps and, and things like that. Greater eternal condemnation. So, rolling to the end here, all this to come to this story of this, this wonderful story here of this widow. We see lastly in part four an, act, an action of the kingdom in verse 21, I'm sorry, verse 41. Jesus moves from a teaching moment to kind of observing. He sits back and he watches people bring offerings to the treasury. And he sees many rich people, we already read this, bring many offerings, many big lump sums of money. But yet then he sees this poor widow bring, come and bring one penny. One penny. And then from that moment, he calls his disciples over and says, hey, guys, look. And he gives them a glimpse. He said, guys, this, this poor widow has put in more than anybody else in this treasure. They have, she, her offering is much more than anything that has been given. Because, I'm going to read it, because she gave out of her poverty, not out of her abundance, because of the condition of her heart, because of where she was. Now, I'm not, we're not going to just glance over that. We're, we're going to get into this idea of this this widow's heart. The significance was not in the penny. No more than the significance was in all the money that the rich people gave. The significance was of the, the servant's heart, the, the action of that widow there because of why she did what she did. And we're going to kind of look at that. She, she is literally a picture of the greatest commandment that we heard in verse 28. She, she literally lives out in that one moment, that one action, the fact that all of her heart and her soul and her mind and her strength relied on on God, and she gave her only penny because of it. So th there is a, a beautiful picture there, and she, she was, uh, she wasn't captivated by money or position as the scribes were. We've seen what those guys were about. No, her her heart was held captive by King Jesus, not by money, not by stuff. Uh, and how about her mind? Did it seem that she worried about her financial position or needs? Uh, 
Not at all. She, she lived on much more. She leaned into the wisdom of God when it concerned what she had to do and why she didn't have but a penny. She didn't worry about that for her future and her well-being. She, she had her, her, her wisdom was found in God's wisdom and understanding. And furthermore, her rest, her soul rested in God alone because it belonged to him. She had nothing else to worry about because she belonged to the king. What else could she do? What else could she need? Whether she had a hundred pennies, it doesn't matter. She rested in King Jesus. She rested in God with her, with her soul. And her confidence was not in man. And then of her strength. As I said, she only had a penny. That was the entire ability. That's all she could do for herself was that penny. That's all she had. Well, she gave it away. Why? Because she didn't need it. Her strength rested in the strength that God supplies. And the, the, the strength of the kingdom, from, from, of the gospel, of more than just what I could do for myself, more than the offerings and the sacrifices, much more of the kingdom of God and the fullness that there is and the hopefulness, as we are discussed, in that kingdom. And she could give away a hundred pennies. It didn't matter. if that all she had because she rested in him and him alone. Thinking of this, how, how will we live as the widow fully relying on God, total reliance, do we? We've already seen that we probably don't. We've discussed this. We feel more like scribes most days than the widow. And, and that's all right. That's a good place to know and be because that's where the gospel comes in. Or even more so, uh, not even the scribes, but the rich young ruler that we've read about. He, he come and he had many things. And Jesus said, give it all away. And the rich young ruler went away sad because he had many possessions and he didn't want to give it up. He wanted his stuff more than Jesus. He chose to live on less. The poor widow chose to live on more. Her reliance on God shines through her actions, her pennies. She chose total reliance on God. This is biblical faith. All her heart, her soul, her mind, her strength, uh, and, and everything that she was. She was not a prisoner to her stuff, even if it wasn't much. But most days, I forget the gospel and live for me. I'm, I'm just to be honest. I really do. I'm, I feel like the rich, young, young ruler. I don't want to give away my stuff. I don't, and this ain't going to do the money. This is my time, my anything. Everything that I am, my heart, soul, mind, and strength, I want to use those things for me. And, and so then I have to rely on me, not on the kingdom, not on God, not total reliance on the Father. Uh, we, we then move and uh, we l begin to live a life that can be explained by ourselves and by what we want. When rather, Jesus has called us to live a life that can only be explained by the gospel. The fact that she gave her penny, the only thing he can explain that this widow gave away all that she had was the gospel. She, she, couldn't, she couldn't have anything more than what she'd already been given. What's a penny to her? She's got plenty. That's what she's thinking. At least her actions would say that and seem that way. So in conclusion, do we, we, are we beginning to see more clearly the hopelessness, hopeful, hopelessness of living on trying to live on more than God as if there is? But that's what the scribes went for. They tried that. They tried to live on more. They wanted to live on more than God. And from that, are we seeing the goodness of being able to run from that desire but, and run to the hopefulness of living fully relying on God and on nothing else with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength? And, and Jesus here has shown us a glimpse of the kingdom, part of how it goes in the kingdom. The, the goodness of the kingdom, are we satisfied with that or are we satisfied with less? He gives us all this, he, a, a life that is willing to be able to rely on God and to give away all that you have for the sake of the kingdom because he died on the cross and made all that true for us that we can be changed for real, that we don't have to be as described, but we can have true, real change and live a life much like the widow who would give away all she had because she had been given all that she needed because of Jesus. Even in her sense, Jesus hadn't went to the cross. She was still living on the Old Testament faith. She was looking forward, and still she clinged to the coming Savior that would just come in a few days, and she would be made known there. She clinged to that. I hope that we're being stirred to seek more after a life of total reliance on God, a life that produces selfless love for others. However, these two great commandments can be heavy on our wills if we try to do them on our own. If we were to try to just, like I said to begin with, to just white knuckle down, grant, and just out of sheer termination, try to make ourselves look like we hold fast to the kingdom, uh, we're going to find ourselves in a misery and then in a whole other whole way of religious living 
that just adds Jesus in. That's a horrible place to go. We don't want to walk that road. We really want to have a life that is truly, truly can only be explained by the gospel, both in our actions and in our standing and everything that we are. That we're not right by our own wills, but we're right because of Jesus, not our own strength and ability. Like I said, this is, and I'm hoping, feeling that weight, feeling our lack and our need that we, we see that this is the perfect place for the gospel to come to our rescue. And when I mean gospel, we mean, or I mean, and I know we mean here, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus, and how each of those make, really put feet and, and ability to, to who we are. It really gives us rest. It really gives us a, a, a standing well, look, look, look at the life of Jesus. Jesus obeyed these two great commandments perfectly. This is shown best in his temptation in the wilderness. He says, the, the, Satan says, I will give you all these kingdoms if you will just bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, no. He says, I will. You, and he quotes the Bible. He said, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's what he says to him. And then later, the second commandment. Jesus, uh, he was perfect in his love for others. This is what it says in John. Greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus was the perfect picture of loving others. His entire life and existence shown that. Uh, existence here on earth would show that. That he has a greater love. He's perfect in that. And we are united with both of those realities in Jesus. When we come to him in faith, his obedience becomes our obedience. So that we have his life lived through us. The life that told Satan, no, I don't want the, I will serve God alone. Or the life that says, no, I'll lay down my life for my friends. That's the Jesus we have and that we serve and then who we have been united with Christ in his life. Not only in his life, but in his death. This is where our failures to love God with all that we are, our failures to have total reliance on God and to be selflessly loving others as ourselves, not uh, to love others as ourselves, uh, those, those shortcomings to do those things get dealt with in his death when jesus died on the cross every bit of our sins every bit of our religious scribe that is in us that may still show its ugly head was was nailed to that cross and he has made peace by the blood of that cross between us and god so his death deals with our failures his life gives us obedience but then in his resurrection we are given the sheer ability through the holy spirit to live lives that are only explained by the gospel because we are living in total reliance on God. We are loving our neighbors as ourselves because Jesus is raised. He didn't just deal, he dealt with the sin. He, we have his obedience. He is resurrected. We are united with him in his resurrection and now are empowered. And we're freed from the penalty. We are freed from our sinful disobediences and we've been given his obedience. So now that we can live a life of total reliance on God in Christ alone, literally in him alone, and we cling to that. So where do we begin right now? In this moment, I say prayer is where we always begin. Not just prayer like, no, gospel-driven, empowered, supported prayer for our hearts and for our souls and for our minds and for our strength and that we love our neighbors, that we cling fast to this and that our, so then Jesus will begin to work out in us a life that can only be explained by the gospel, a life of total reliance on him. Let us pray.